kicked off, so we'll get going. Um, thank you everyone for joining us on this Tuesday afternoon. It's lovely uh, to be talking to you. So my name's uh, Sarah Wendland. I'm a recently qualified educational psychologist. I did my training at UCL and um, I'm here with two wonderful colleagues of mine and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi everyone, nice to see you all. Um, so I'm Lauren Bagley. I'm currently in year three uh, of my training and I'm at the University of Southampton and doing my placement here with the lovely Southend team. Hi, and I'm Jamie Allen. Um, I'm a trainee at University of East London. Um, I'm in my second year, so I've just started with Southend in September. So as you all know, we're here to talk about obviously our experiences of getting onto the doctorate and think about that application process and to try and answer any questions you might have because I think we all go through it and we all feel a little bit like it's a bit of a mystery. It's that, that, that I don't know, it's the elusive thing of getting through, getting an interview and hopefully getting a place and then once you're on the course, reflect back on that, that process. Um, so we're going to talk to you a little bit about that and to start us off, I know Jamie's got um, a bit of a mentee poll to go through so he'll explain that and then we'll start sharing our slides and talking about the experiences. Thank you Sarah. So here I'm going to share my screen now. Um, up here you've got, so the question is we're going to pose to you is what drew you to educational psychology? So if you can go on to www.menti.com and enter in the code up there, it will bring you to this wonderful page where you can submit your answers. And what we'll hopefully get is a lovely word cloud with all your wonderful answers. And what we'd like to do is give you a chance to kind of reflect on the values that you hold and why they are beneficial to education psychology and what makes you want to go into this field. So um, what I'm gonna do is leave this here for a minute or so, and we'll kind of see some answers, but what we'll do is we'll come back to this at the end as well. So don't feel a rush to put your answer in now, you know, we'll, we'll go back to it at the end to kind of look through it. Thank you, Jamie. And I think as some of these things pop in, maybe we'll start by explaining a little bit of what we did before we got on the course. So you've got a bit of an understanding of who we are as well. Um, so if it's all right, I'll start with that. So as I said, obviously my name is Sarah and I studied at UCL. And before the course, I did um, three different jobs. So I had a, a year of a one-to-one -one, uh, teaching assistant with a pupil in reception who had at that time a statement of educational needs for autism. Following that, I then became an assistant center in a, um, in a mainstream secondary school, which was quite large. And then I also, within that secondary school, took on um, child protection and all the safeguarding aspects as well. Um, so that was my experience before moving onto the course. And Lauren and Jamie will share theirs as well. Yeah, so um, shall I go next? Yeah. So, okay, so my experience, I started out as a learning support assistant, and I know I've seen lots of questions from various people about being a learning support assistant and, um, you know, that, that level of experience. So I absolutely would say, yes, that's a great level of experience to have. Um, and really within that role, it was in a secondary school. And what I was thinking was just seeking some opportunities uh, going forward with that career and the different things that I was doing that would match up really nicely with the course and, and with what I wanted to do and, and finding ways to get that experience in different ways. So that led to me becoming a non-qualified teacher. And so I was working with children at risk of exclusion. Uh, in that role and then I took a little bit of a different angle and I actually studied um, cognitive behavioural therapy um, for children and young people so I took a little bit of a different route and I ended up going into a therapeutic background which again was really great at giving me lots of skills and experiences to apply. And I did my undergrad in psychology um, and from there, I was working as a uh, learning assistant for a primary school. Um, I did some work in 
so, uh, year one and year six. And then I moved on to work in a secondary pupil referral unit as a LSA again, um, before taking up some work doing ABA tutoring um, for young people with autism. Um, and that was an adult, well, 19 plus provision. Um, and then my last job before getting on the course was a pastoral officer in a secondary school. Um, so I kind of just jumped about a bit, trying to get as much kind of diverse experience as possible. Um, and I think that really helped, actually, because it helped me figure out the areas that I want to work in, the specialisms that I want to go. And I think that's reflected in my practice. I think now I know kind of the psychologist I want to be, as it were. And I'd completely agree with that, Jamie. I think having those different opportunities and being able to reflect between roles was something that really helped my application as well. Um, and for those, obviously, who are out there who might be on their second or third application, it took me three times to, to get on the course. And actually, every year um, I reapplied, I felt like I had a better understanding of actually who I was, what psychology I was using, and, and where I wanted to go with that, because it really learning curve and, and throughout the course um, both before the course and on the course it, it is a lot about learning about who you are what your values are what you believe in and how those then inform the way you work with children or the um, the ways you approach different situations um, so that's certainly something that I'm continually developing but thinking back to my personal statement that was probably the, the real starting point of it and identifying my core values and what am I bringing to to that opportunity really um, so I think what you've all been sharing so far has been great I'm loving reading all of these uh, there's so many of them resonate with myself but we do have some slides to share so we'll swap over to the slides go through those and then come back to this at the end if that's okay um, so I'm going to start sharing the slides now hopefully and while Sarah's just sharing that, what I will say is um, we, we're talking about varied experience, but also that can be within your role. So if you've been in a role for a long time, um, you will certainly have developed different experiences within that. So um, as we've been saying, it's very much about looking back at those core values, what's important to you, why do you want to do this through your work? And you will have done that through varied roles or the same role in different experiences. So it's, it's absolutely, it's, we're always going to come back to those values and, and that reflection. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. And I suppose that leads us really nicely on to this is the, the four areas that we thought were quite important when we were preparing to apply. So the reflecting, the reading we did around things, the talking to other people and just gaining that back and those conversations were really important. And hopefully we'll be able to share that as we go through. Um, if you've got any questions or comments or anything, please do put them in the questions or the chat because we will get hopefully time to talk about them as well. So should we start by thinking about reflecting, which I think is probably the biggest part of maybe the personal statement or thinking about applying is really starting to engage in that um, reflection on what you've done and, and what psychology you've been used and that was it's often used when I look at the Facebook group and through talking to others is what psychology are you using think about the psychology and for me I did that through really specific examples um, which was really obvious so I talked about specific teaching approaches and I thought about a specific intervention I've been um, implementing through my roles and using that as a really explicit aspect of psychology but I know um, other um, people have used much broader theories. Um, so talking about person-centered approaches, things that span across lots of different areas of work. And it's really about using what, what you've done, what your experience is, because that's the most important thing because you're the one reflecting on it. And I know Lauren and Jamie have got examples of what they did as well. I think it's, you know, I think it's quite easy to forget how personal this statement needs to be, you know, reflects on kind of what Sarah just said it's about you it's about your personal experiences so while we might like Lauren kind of touched on as well like while we might sit here and say oh I, I did loads of different things and loads of different jobs being in the same being the same job isn't 
a bad thing either. Like it's, it's about your personal experiences and how that's going to get you on the course. Um, so we've kind of, we decided to give this learning cycle to you. Um, and this is kind of something that was introduced to me while I was on the course. Um, I think it can be really beneficial to think about those experiences you've had, the feelings that you've had, and think about how these can be benefit benefit of you for the application. Yeah, I remember um, feeling very worried actually about um, going broader and being quite general and reflective. Um, but as, as we keep saying, actually that was the important part was that I was coming back to my values. I was reflecting on the things that I was doing, my personal values in my work. And I was thinking about what changes needed to be made, what changes I made personally. Um, and even if, you know, perhaps there have been barriers and I hadn't been able to make changes, I was reflecting on that as well. So it was all um, for me kind of about telling the story of my thinking, if you like. Um, and I felt very worried that that had been too general, but it, it just goes to show if it's a personal reflection and it's you reflecting back on your values and thinking about your practice and the things that you do, how you make that person centered, what's important to you. Those are the key, you know, there's, there's no magic answer essentially. It's your experience and it's your personal reflections. And I completely agree with that, Lauren. I think when I was applying, I always, knowing my psychology was always an area that I felt like I didn't know and I was always really worried that actually maybe I wasn't using psychology or I wasn't doing something but you everybody is using psychology and just thinking about it in those sort of basic terms of actually building a relationship that's using psychology thinking about those those moments and making it really about you and what you've learned um, is really important and I think it is quite a nerve wracking process, writing that personal statement, sharing what you've done um, and possibly having those feelings that you haven't done enough, but actually you're not expected to know it all and really try and remember that and hold that. Actually, they're looking for what you're already doing and thinking about how you can progress and move forwards. They're not expecting you to know all the different theories out there, not expecting you to understand every single way psychology can be used in an, in an environment because that's what you're going to learn and that's what you continue to learn. And, and even as a qualified EP now, I'm still on that journey. I'm still learning. It's a great part of the EP profession is that actually we all want to continue learning and we all accept that actually we're never going to reach the full knowledge of everything because if we did, then, well, our jobs, I suppose, we wouldn't really have them, would we? <laughs> so really it, holding that in mind that actually what you're writing about, if it's writing about your personal experiences, that is good enough and um, it's what they want to see and to hear about. It's just come through um, about using psychology and not being able to identify specifically what psychology it is. Um, and I think what is really important is when we spoke in the last slides, we were talking about reading. And I think that's, you know, there are places that you can access literature out there you know google scholar is free you might not be able to access all of them um but there are you know options for there to be reading you know there are textbooks you know that are possible and really beneficial that we will we'll come on to later um and i think what i've often been asked is 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 this is this too broad is this too popular psychology is the psychology that i'm saying too well known and no because it's not, and any psychology is beneficial. I, you know, I spoke about Maslow, um, you know, and attachment theory, because those are the ones that I knew and the ones that I knew were being, I was able to use in my practice. So when Sarah, you know, like Sarah said, I think it's really important that you do what you know, and because you're not expected to know every single framework an EP uses, then you're not supposed to know every theory because that, like so I said, the reason you're supposed to be getting on. Um, so just try and do some broad reading around areas that you're interested in as well, because if you're doing it around the areas you're interested in, you're much more likely to find out where you're using your own psychology. Yeah, definitely. And certainly, as you just said about reading around things you're interested in, obviously my the, the role I had just before I got on was within child protection. So a lot of my 
um, psychology and things came from um, understanding child protection, understanding children in care, and um, and reading about that and and taking that knowledge and thinking about how psychology um, can be applied and is used within education, but also just in broader terms as well. And I think um, there's quite a few questions out there about sort of thinking about your kind of role and if it's not directly in education currently or it's not got that obvious link, it, it, it doesn't matter. It really is about thinking about the psychology you're using with children and young people and their families. And that could be in any setting. So it might be in more of a clinical setting or it might be in more of a, um, a, a, a safeguarding profession or an early intervention setting. So it really is about how you use that psychology um, within those. So don't worry if you're not directly in education or within those settings at the moment. I think um, you've reminded me, Sarah, saying that a lot um, that seems to come up is about knowing that you are absolutely using it, but how to reflect on that and, and how am I specifically using it? How specific do the examples go? And um, I've just been thinking while we're looking at this, if you're, you know, if you're talking with people about your practice and about the reasons that you want to do this, if you're looking at current issues, you're reading about topics that you're interested in, you're already thinking about how psychology is informing what you do. Um, and that, that, you know, unfortunately, there really isn't a straightforward answer to how specific should you be about the theory you used or this specific example. But I would say if you're reflecting back on what informed your thinking and the reasons why you are doing what you're doing, you will find that you are using and applying that psychology. You don't, you know, great if you're saying I'm applying this theory, but if you're thinking psychologically, if you're taking a person-centered approach, if there's things that you're reading and discussing that are informing your approach, you are absolutely applying psychology. And so kind of don't lose the value of that. There will be things that you're doing in your everyday experience um, where you're reflective and you're thinking things through in a person-centered way. And you will absolutely find that doing some reading and having some discussion, you think that's where I'm applying it. I'm, I'm doing it. You know, that's that's almost the dream psychology is when we're applying it without even thinking. It's, it's in our mind and we're thinking about it. Um, so, so don't be disheartened by that, I guess, thinking I just don't know what it is that I'm doing because you absolutely are. And it's that process of reflection that brings you to that thinking. Definitely. And something I found really beneficial and as much as I found it quite difficult, but actually asking other people to read my personal statement and give their feedback on it as well. Um, a really great way just to see what they're taking from what you've written and, and what they think the key points or the key messages are that you're trying to share, because um, obviously you don't get many words. Uh, you're very limited with that character count, as we all remember. Um, so being able to convey your message in a really concise way is a really important skill to be able to have. So I um, shared it with my mum and said, what do you think I'm trying to say? And she was like, I think you're trying to say these key points. And if they weren't what I was actually wanting to say, I was like, right, I need to rephrase this. So using those opportunities to gain feedback, um, if you're comfortable doing it around your statements, a really great way to move forwards. Can say I think that was pretty much all our slides. Um, so we're very happy to have some questions and we'll also check back on Menti as well. So I will stop sharing my screen and um, I can see there's already a few things in the questions and the chat which I'll take a moment to look at. If Jamie, you want to bring up the Menti again maybe? Yeah, no problem. Um, and just thinking back to kind of my application, because it's, you know, like we've said, it's difficult because you know, there is no magic formula. It, you know, even when we're on, you know, we're not told this magic formula of how we got on. You know, it, it is so personal. And so, you know, it, it's really important that you kind of just use your experiences in order to show how you can apply psychology and what is I found useful is going to the open days um, for the universities looking around each university because I knew from within two three minutes of being in a UEL open day like this was the university I wanted to be in and just as much as you're so desperate to get on 
you need to know that you're going to the right university and applying to the right university for you. Um, and I potentially took a bit of a risk and I wrote my statement aimed at UEL. And had I not got on, maybe I might have tried a different tactic the next year, but who knows? But I think it's knowing what is important to the universities, what kind of values they hold and see if they align with your own is a really important way of figuring out where you want to be and how you want to you know, progress. I think that's such a good point, Jamie, because definitely you can have a look at the different universities and, you know, one silver lining to everything being virtual now is that we've actually got more opportunity to do that um, and attend virtually and have a look at things online. Um, and I would say if those values are matching up with the values that you have, and there's so many fantastic ones here that I can see, then that will shine through in what you're talking about because you feel it and it's important to you. It links well with the university course that you're looking at. And that that will come through. Um, so it's it's you know we keep saying about values, but it is so important, um, and it's helpful. Yeah, just just looking at some of the questions that are coming through. Uh, lots of you seem to be thinking about sort of how much information to give, how in depth you should go. Do you need to reference things? Um, so personally, in my personal statement, I I, I labelled um, some psychological theories. So I explicitly used sort of like I said Maslow's hierarchy of need I didn't go into depth about what that was I had made the assumption that the people reading it would know what that was so I didn't explicitly explain the theory but I did name the theory that I'd used um, if I knew what the theory was called um, so I didn't I didn't reference like I would in an academic paper I just I just wrote it um, there's a few questions about style I and I think that really is a personal preference on how you would approach something um, and, and do it. I know I wrote in probably quite a formal way, I would say, um, but I know other people have done much more personal reflective accounts and they've got on the course with that. So again, it really is about doing what you feel comfortable and confident um, and conveying those personal values you've, you've got. Um, and someone said that they can't think how to start it. And I struggled with that, but I made myself a, a mind map of all the different things that I wanted to include, or I thought were important to include and started it from there. Um, so that was how I approached it. I'm sure there's other ways around it. I don't know if Jamie and Lauren have got any ideas of how to start. <laughs> I, I definitely sympathise with the person that asked that. I really struggled as well. Um, and um, I also applied three times. And each time I had that battle of um, how much should I change the statement and should I stick with what I was saying and just develop it a bit more. And it's really, really difficult. But I found it really... I love that idea of the mind map. I actually wish I'd done that. Um, but I'd, I really liked thinking to myself how do I want to almost introduce myself and tell my story and so I thought about the key parts of my story that I wanted to get through and that just really helped me to almost do a bit of an introduction key points and rounding it up and um, that's just personally the way that I found it most helpful um, but there were many many drafts <laughs> as I'm sure you're all in the process of doing at the moment and yeah I would say giving it to people to read through because people will point out things that you do as well um, so if you're brave enough to for people to have a look and for you to say does this reflect me you know how does this sound you'll get some good ideas back so um, I would say be brave and share it with people it's really helpful yeah, I, I'm just trying to think now. Sometimes I feel like I've just blocked it out a little bit. What well, the approach, the whole process. But um I I wish I'd again I wish I'd done a mind map. I did mind maps for the interview questions, but I didn't do mind map for the and I think I just I remember writing as an aspiring educational psychologist and then just not knowing no word would follow and I just could not get anything else down. And I think I ended up, list, I guess it's similar to Mike, but I listed the roles that I'd had and tried to reflect on what the psychology had that I'd used in those roles or the experiences that I got from those roles, why those roles led me in this direction. Um, and I think that was a really good tool just to constantly ask him why. Um, why, why educational psychology? Why did that role inspire me to move to this 
move in this direction. We've um, we've got a really great question around, obviously, if you are applying maybe for your second or third time, did we adapt our personal statements that much? Um, did we make any changes from constructive feedback, etc.? So I know for my personal personal statement, I, I don't think it changed a huge amount. I, I actually kept the same personal statement and just made slight adjustments as I went through. So as my roles changed, adding a little bit more in, if I felt there was a, a better or more pertinent example, I put that in. But the main outline and basis stayed the same for me every single year. And constructive feedback. So I um, had interviews all three of my applications. So I, I was lucky enough to get some feedback from the interviews, which I, they don't give you much feedback. So don't expect reams and reams of information from any UD. But um, some do indicate maybe areas which um, you didn't perform as strongly on or where they thought you could do a bit more of improvement. And um, I read those and then I tried to think about more concrete examples where I could explicitly show that I had those skills or that knowledge um, within that area and made sure that either went into the personal statement or at the interview process, really trying to make sure I demonstrated that in a clearer way. It's been said, there's so many questions coming in. Thank you so much. I'm just trying to like get through them all. I'm just, um, I'm noticing there's a couple about um, kind of interview process and things like that, which unfortunately we can't um, answer any questions on things about the actual interview process and, and things like that, just because it wouldn't be fair um, to everybody. But I've seen some really interesting ones about um, how much you're putting in your preference for a certain university. Um, again, I know it's the answer to everything, but it's very personal. I personally didn't say that this was my preference, um, but I saw something in there about um, mentioning research that um, your university of preference has done. I think that's absolutely fantastic. I think if you can show that you're looking up um, any current research, but if you've got a preference of a university and they've done some research that you're really interested in, absolutely, I would I would comment on that either specifically or more generally, because if you can show that you're looking at these current issues, you're interested in them, and you can give a bit of a personal edge on the things you like, I think that's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I can second that. I, I didn't, again, like I said, I, I wrote my statement hoping to get onto UEL and I didn't ever mention UEL. I never said I want to, but what I did do is I saw what positive psychology was really important to UEL. So I, I kind of researched a bit about that and wrote that in and I it really resonated with me um, and their values on social justice um, was, they quite clearly state that. And I think that was something that also resonated with me strongly. So I wrote about that. So like Lauren said, you can show them show the university that you're interested in their line of work without naming one. I think it's a good way to go about it. Yeah, I would definitely agree. I, I see there's quite a few questions around sort of once you're on the course, balancing um, studying and placements and things like that. And every course um, does things differently. So I would definitely say, look at the universities, see what um, they're offering and, and how they do things because it is very different so for UCL um, you're not at uni every single day whereas I know other universities you are at university every single day so it really varies so I would recommend just um, looking at what's available already and attending open evenings as we've already discussed and very similarly someone said do you enjoy the job and um, yes I absolutely love the job it is definitely what I was expected and even more um, so certainly from my point of view I very much enjoy it don't get me wrong training is very stressful at times and you have to be prepared for that but ultimately this was definitely what I wanted to do and I I, I wouldn't ever change that <laughs> I don't know if Lauren and Jamie would agree with that <laughs> now I'm out the other side <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that question. Um, and I noticed there was a bit in there. Do you enjoy the job? And looking back, is there a piece of advice you could give yourself before applying, which I love? Um, yeah, similar to Sarah. Yes, I love the job. And I think when you fought this hard and you, you keep coming back and you, you know, to be writing this statement and being in this competitive process, 
you absolutely know your reasons for wanting to do it and then when you're able to learn about the things that you're interested in and apply that in your practice it's it is so enjoyable and it's so varied the things that you can do so definitely a big yes to that even though of course yes it can be stressful but I would say absolutely worth it um, and enjoyable and I guess the advice that I would give myself before applying when I think back um, and in our discussions when we thought about this webinar I just wish that I would have had more faith in my reflections um, and which was why I've gone on about values and reflections so much because I um, second guessed a lot of the things that I was talking about whether they were specific enough good enough examples and actually the important part was that I was already applying psychology because I was being reflective and I was thinking about how effective what I was doing was and how I could change it so as cheesy as it sounds trust in yourself that you know you're in this process for a reason you have good values for why you want to do it and trust that the reflections you're making are useful um, because they absolutely are Yeah, I completely agree with that advice, Lauren. And certainly when I reflect back on my three applications, I can see my own personal growth across them. And actually, if I got on the first time, I, I, I wasn't ready to be an EP. I really wasn't ready to be that. And I suppose that process and those opportunities, if you have them at interview, I, I think the people you who interview you can see that. And so don't, it, as much as it's really hard to don't be upset or let down when you do, if you don't get on the course because actually we've all got the skills and it's just about being confident to use them and for them people to see that within you and I definitely think about my three applications definitely on the third I felt the best about it um, and I was very glad that I got on the course at that time obviously um, I was going to say there's some questions here around sort of the level of understanding of an EP's role um, and sharing that in your statement. Um, I suppose I don't think I really actually explicitly spoke about the EP role, but considering I was working in a school, I did know about the EP role, but I it wasn't to any great level of detail. So I don't think I actually commented much on that. I don't know if Lauren or Jamie actually commented on the EP role. Um, I might have spoken about some challenges in the EP profession that were coming up just because I was aware of them. But again, that's because I was aware of them and I, you know, I, I also was quite lucky in the sense that my, um, fiance is also a tech. And so we had constant discussions and could, again, you know, read each other's statements and bounce things off each other. So that was, and I'm probably quite unique in that sense. Um, but it's, it was like, yeah, the psychology that I knew about difficulties in the profession or things that were coming up, but then it's not necessary that you have to put them, I don't think, because like you're there to learn about educational psychology. That's the, you know, the reason you get onto the doctorate. And Jamie, just thinking about that, there's a question here about someone is asking about advice about being critical of the current situation and whether you sort of were more cautious around that because they didn't want to look too negative. I mean, sort of you you just said that you used some of that sort of current world stuff that's going on. Yeah. Hope that uh, I didn't reflect on anything like that in my statement. <laughs> No, so mine was, I remember there was a green paper around the mental health practitioners in schools at the time I was applying. So I, I just commented that it's an area that I'd be interested in moving forward. Um, I'm just trying to think if I, because the ABA role I was in, I think I maybe suggested that there were flaws to the system in my statement, but I wasn't overly critical of it, I think. that's Yeah, I would say that I'd suggested that behaviourism was not the only form of um was not the only answer but that I did stay professional within my role so um yeah I, you can display a preference I guess but I wouldn't go overly critical and also again ca characters and the amount of characters you have it's not possible to go into full explanations and so yeah mm. and I think again it kind of comes down to you've got to write what you feel comfortable with sharing 
um, and think about that, which I know we've talked about a lot, but it really is about your core values, about your experience, and just having the opportunity to show that in a way that you feel best fits you as a person. And that can look very different um, to, be, to different people. And that's, again, a beauty about working within the EP community. We all come out with the same qualification. We are all educational psychologists, but actually we're all very different people and we all bring different qualities and different strengths to the profession, um, which is part of the job I really love. You work together um, with so many different people and, and we do have all those different strengths. Um, which is shown through who gets on the course um, and who's who comes through interview etc I know someone else asked about um, sort of diversity of roles on courses um, so I know for, for my cohort we did have um, I would say the majority were had been um, assistant psychologists um, however there was also a group of us who had never been an assistant EP and we all came from sort of teaching roles or um, learning support roles, um, community support workers, um, so roles that were with children and young people but not directly um, through an EP service or the local authority. I don't know about Lauren and Jamie. Yeah, um, we had quite a mixture actually. We, we had a real mix of experiences, of ages, of backgrounds, um, which makes a lot of our discussions very interesting and, and brings a lot to the table, but also is reassuring to know that those different experiences are um, uplifted, they're held up, they're, they're things that universities are looking at. So um, I've, I've seen a lot on um, various groups about applying um, worries about um, the type of experience that you have, the breadth of it, um, maybe some people feeling that some types of experience are held higher than others. Um, I, I'm only speaking from my experience, but I, I would certainly say that um, part of the EP role is, is looking systemically at, on all different levels. And so I would say definitely the universities are looking at that in their cohorts as well. They want that varied experience. Um, and those different roles, it makes for really good discussions um, in the same way that similar roles make for good discussions. So it's, yeah, I'd say very varied for me. Yeah, definitely very varied for me. I think I'm just off the top of my head, there are five out of 15 were assistants. Um, but then, you know, we, then it ranges from people who were LSAs to people like myself with kind of varied experiences and then teachers who've been teaching for 20 years so there's it's real range you know some have been teaching for five so there were senkos so there's lots of different ranges um of people and i think lauren touched on it we learned so much from each other i think that's really important and it is bizarre because it's such a competitive start it's so competitive to get on the course and that first day you're on it the competition is gone it just stops and everyone is in it together and learning together um, and is there for each other. So it's, it's yeah, it's, we understand how competitive it is at the moment and how intense it can be as well. Um, so we really kind of hope that this is providing some support to you all. Yeah, and I definitely agree, Jamie, that actually we do learn so much from each other and we do take so much support from each other on the course. And before the course, I wasn't part of the Facebook group and I didn't really reach out to anyone else applying. But I do know that there are other people out there um, and there is other support mechanisms, too. So do reach out. I mean, everyone in the EP community is so helpful and so kind. And certainly from my experience, whenever I spoke to an EP, they were always so helpful and keen to support anybody who was thinking about getting on. Um, so do try and make those links, you know, use the Facebook group, Twitter. Um, Sarah's put in the chat about um, Tim Cox's um, Agents of Hope podcasts. Uh, there's the EdSci blogs. There's so many different ways that you can um, get in contact and try and get some information. So really do uh, make use of them as much as you as much as you want, um, because obviously you might not want to because it is it is a an anxiety provoking experience going through it, um, but hopefully with a positive outcome at the end. Um, I'm just quite aware of time. I hadn't realized how much time had gone past. And um, thank you so much for your questions. I don't know if Lauren or Jamie have got anything else they want to say, but please, if, if you have put a question in there and it's not been answered, please do get in contact with us. You know, 
um, send us a tweet or something, we'd be more than happy to answer. I'm just aware of time. <laughs> yeah, it's been um, such a good discussion. I think we could all probably go on all night. Um, and I would just go back to that point again, and I know I keep saying it, but there really is a magic answer and, and this is what you should do. Trust in yourself and your reflections on your experiences, the things that are important to you, the reasons that you're doing it and how you're doing what you're doing. Um, and the rest will follow. Um, just, you know, trust in yourself, put that out there um, and just absolute best of luck, everybody um, applying. We know it's a it's a stressful time, but a wonderful time when your hard work pays off. Um, we'll be hoping to hear from you as TEP soon. Yeah, definitely. Good luck, everyone. I really, yeah, wish the best for you all. Most definitely. Good luck. Um, keep going. And we, we hopefully look forward to communicating and linking up in the future. Um, so thank you all very much for attending and I hope you have a lovely evening.